my own words seem so inadequate in compared with the great preaching that Tim did and the great testimony that June gave us. I want to read to you from the scriptures some things that I will allude to. By the way, these papers that you received are for your perusal later so that you can remember some of the things I've no doubt your memory is rather full for the day. And so that I don't have to say all, I have way too much here to talk about. I didn't have a printer for my computer, so I couldn't really compose on it and uh, organize this together. I'll give you a little outline here, and a great deal of what I want to say is in that essay, Let God Christ Cure the Deadly Cancer of Self. The real thing that God has to do <laughs> is to convince us to deny ourselves and take up the cross and follow Jesus. Amen. We've heard those words, but it does mean that we really have no right to live our own lives when God offers us the life of his spirit, his own life. He made us, as June said, as creatures to love and to share himself and to infuse himself into us and to multiply himself. Amen. And we are made to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now what I want to read is from John 12, some of the statements of Jesus the week before he was crucified. Beginning in the 12th chapter of John, with the verse 22, no, 23. Jesus said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. Anyone who hangs on to my life, it's mine, is going to lose it for sure. But he who gives up his life as if he hated it is going to find it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant be. Amen. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, deliver me from this hour. But for this hour, for this purpose, came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. And a voice came from heaven. I have son, I'm going to again. That's my paraphrase. Let's turn now to Romans 5. First of the chapter, Romans 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, that is, counted innocent by our faith in the gospel, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in our hope of the glory of God. More than that, can you get this? We rejoice in our sufferings. Isn't that crazy? No, no it isn't. I was lecturing at Cincinnati Bible Seminary on the New Testament lectures a number of years ago, and I emphasize that the New Testament teaches this covenant with God for life and death by which we, by faith, surrender our life to him and accept his life. The death of Jesus is our death and the gift of the Holy Spirit is Jesus' life in us and that's all we need and we must give up self and let him be our life. That was the gist of it. It was a set of lectures in which there was opportunity for discussion or question and the psychologist on the faculty question. He said, that's the kind of thing that makes mental illness. I said, I don't mean the attempt to put yourself to death for your own self and by your own power. I mean you accept and believe the gift that God gives us. He gives us a perfect life in exchange for our surrender of our old and sinful and worthless life. Yes. Now, uh, I'm glad George Mark Elliott and others spoke up and defended my position, but that's the only position I have. I have 10 children, and at least three of them have given me back talk 
I can't believe that we don't have a right to be ourselves. One of them, my youngest son, 45 years old, an accomplished man with a terrific memory, I always wanted to be a good preacher, but he works for the film industry in Hollywood. I'm neither disappointed in that, but just a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to drive him to the Kansas City Airport and uh, had a captive audience. I had a chance for the most earnest talk with him I'd had for 25 years. And I said, I've been proud of you and Jonathan for the things you can do. His next older brother just teaches in Southwest Missouri State University and, and he has great skills and accomplishments. These fellows can do about anything they want to do. I said, you've not made me ashamed of you, but I'm ashamed of myself because I want to apologize for you for teaching you more the duties of a, what was expected of a son in our family or in a, a Christian's duties, what we ought to do, than I taught you of the love of God and what it can do through you. I was hoping to get that down and maybe by having had that opportunity to have a chance to send by mail some follow-up that will still take hold, but his answer was, I disagree with you, but I appreciate what you said. And I've had some longer discussions with one of my daughters, a brilliant tutor lady that just uh, can't agree that we have to utterly disown our own life and let God give us the life he wants to give us. And that's better. Amen. As long as you hold on to, I got to be me. It's my life and I'll live it. So many, so, oh, the general whole race thinks, my life is my own and my life is the body. And if I please the body, I have satisfaction in life. I'm satisfied. No, no indeed. The body has its desires that are against the spirit. The spirit has its desires that are against the body. And they're contrary to one another, and you cannot do the things that you would. The desires of the flesh lead to the things that are listed there in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, a list of vices and sins, including factions and parties and divisions. The practices of the church demonstrate the failure of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering kindness and goodness, faithfulness and meekness and self-control. God's commandments are not grievous, but they're different. They're often misunderstood. Did we read all of this? Now, back Romans 5 again. We rejoice in our suffering. Because we know that suffering produces endurance or steadfastness, and that produces character, and that produces hope. Hope. Huh. What's the value of hope? People hope for a lot of things without any benefit or substance to them. But hope in Christ will never put us to shame. How do we know? Because the love of God has already been poured forth into our lives. Junior, so right. If the love of God has changed my attitude, where I used to want to clobber somebody, I want to help. Where I used to want to defend myself, I want to submit. <laughs> oh, the love of God is what is the fruit of the Spirit and makes us know that Christ dwells in us. Amen. That's the passage I wanted you to hear. And now... Let's get just this little bit from the third chapter of Titus, which is pretty plain. It's summarized in a different way. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and to authorities and to be obedient, to be ready for any honest work or honorable work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all men. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to the various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Father appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness which we done ourselves, 
but according to him, his mercy, he saved us by the washing of rebirth and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God made us good in his sight and put us in a good environment originally, but the exercise of self-will with the desire for something more, for something that would make us feel bigger about ourselves, led to Adam and Eve separating themselves from the source of life. And God invented death in love so that he'd have a way to bring us back into fellowship with himself. Amen. Death is your friend. Death is a gift of God. We face a reality that we cannot live without God, in opposition to God and away from God. And we find out that God laid all that punishment and guilt and, and uh, his terrible displeasure with sin upon himself on the cross and showed his love. And he invites us to have the gumption to accept his offer of a new covenant, the covenant of death. Be baptized into his death. And to rise to walk in newness of life, a new creature made of God, filled with God. In Galatians 3.27, says many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And it's for remission of sins and uh, a fellowship of all kinds of people in that. But down the page, four or five inches, 419 says, My little children, I'm in labor pains all over again for you till Christ be formed in you. Yes. I call this the twofold work of the gospel. I'm just reminding Boyce Moten yesterday of that. And I said, You remember my illustration? You can sit by the fire and with a moment's thrust put the poker into the fire. That's the way it is with our baptism. As soon as you hear like the Ethiopian treasurer, the message, you can be baptized that day into Christ. But that's not the end of the matter. That's just the beginning of the transformation by the end in Christ into your hearts. It takes longer and has more effect to get the fire into the poker. When you can pull the poker out and it's white hot, that's different. The church has been contented to baptize and to try to claim those as members of Christ. But it loses the majority of them. We haven't emphasized enough that in being baptized you surrender the right to choose your own breakfast, to comb your own hair, or to go on your own vacations any way you want to. You belong to Christ. And his commandments are not grievous. Now, they sometimes are challenging. I'm glad you agree with that much. Are God's commandments ever burdensome? Some translations use the word burdensome. Well, sometimes they appear to be. The rich young ruler, Luke 18, and also in Matthew 19, 16 to 30. I want to bring the harmony up here and read you so much. that That's a story. Here was a young man who had kept all the commandments, he thought. He was a ruler of a synagogue, no doubt, and he had much property, and he had the right idea that Jesus was a teacher come from God, and he came to ask him the right question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and come follow me. What did he do? He said, I can't do that. That's a grievous commandment. That's a big order. So I thought for you to grasp this, I'd say, I remember when Gibbon Blakely came to Joplin from Merrillville and the area up there in Indiana. I'd known him and his father before. And he talked to me one day at my house about uh, the Zelikan house on 4th and Sargent and uh, what to pay for it and so forth. I don't know if he followed my advice or not, probably paid more than I suggested, I'm cheap. But uh, <laughs> here's what I thought. What if I'd had from God a commandment to order given to give up all his property, all that he had, and join those who walk and have not a place to lay their head? I asked Given yesterday, he'd care if I mentioned this. He said, I want to do that. 
I'll do it if God says so. Well, you remember the case when God's prophet Elijah, in the great famine of more than three years, had to leave the brook Kivas because it dried up. And the Lord told him, go clear across the country over to by Sidon to a little town called Zarephath and to a widow's house there. And he walked up and said, could you get me a drink of water? And then he said, by the way, bring me a little cake. She said, I have a handful of meal, a little bit of oil. I'm about to make the last cake for myself and my son, and we're going to die of starvation. God said, give me a cake first through Elijah. And her jar of meal never ran out. And her cruise of oil never ran out. Put God first. Put God first in everything. God's commandments are not grievous. God was giving her a benefit that thousands of widows in Israel might have rejoiced to have. Are God's commandments are grievous? Well, God told Abraham, get up and leave your place. He walked a long way to a strange country. He didn't know where he was going. And he waited a long time, at least 25 years, for God to fulfill some of those promises. And he had this son, Isaac. When Isaac was a big kid, maybe 12, 14 years of age, I think it's impossible to tell just how old. God said, take Isaac up to Mount Moriah and put him to death as a sacrifice for me. And Abraham did. On the third day, they saw the place. Carrying their own wood and fire. I think they had to have wood to keep the fire burning all that time. They didn't have any matches, didn't have a cigarette lighter, anything else. On the third day, they saw the place and they prepared to go up Mount Moriah at Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. And Isaac asked a question, here's the food, here's the wood, and here's the fire. Where's the, sac- where's the lamb? I don't know how Abraham controlled his voice to say, God will provide a lamb. And they let him tie the boy up and lay him on the wood and raise his knife to plunge into his heart. And God said, Abraham. And he did provide the ram caught in the thicket. Abraham did not waver in unbelief. He hoped against hope. He believed that God could raise him from the dead. Abraham gives us a good example of what it is to believe God when his commandments would seem grievous. You do what God said, and he'll take care of the consequences. Well, a man named Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the church, quite honestly, and traveling from Jerusalem about 150 miles to a foreign country's capital, Damascus, to capture Christians and bring them back for punishment. And the Lord stopped him on the way in a bright light. And he changed his life so completely, so suddenly, that it's hard for people to believe the change of Saul. One scholar thought he could, could, uh, well, two men, Gilbert West and I forget the name of the other, agreed a long time ago to, uh, in England, to write books against the resurrection of Christ and the conversion of Saul to explain them naturally that and as not true works of God, and they both were converted. They had, when they met together, said they could not explain away the work of God in these things. Yes. So Saul seemed to change so rapidly, he was able, by the inspiration of God, to preach in Damascus and in Arabia and back in Damascus and not even receive the laying on of the apostles' hands for the Holy Spirit for three years after that. And he is a great example of what God can do. Most of us, as has been indicated, rather gradually grow. I I just admire all that Tim said, and he covered so much scripture, and it was so much what I want here. I'm glad that we can now approach this a little more. But I want you to see the apostles, Paul, had to face from the beginning, I'll show him what things he must suffer for my name's sake. And you read in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12 some of the things he suffered. 
He mentioned about fighting with wild beasts at Ephesus. We know nothing more about that. And he talked about how the things he had suffered at Ephesus. We thought Ephesus, three years there, and all the state of Asia hearing the word, that's just the western end of Asia Minor, but a state about the size of Indiana, maybe. In three years' time, all what he accomplished. But it wasn't all accomplishment. There was great suffering involved. Does Jesus' commandments ever stump you? Turn the other cheek. 